Hello, my name is Cleveland Simmons and I'm a partner at Seacrest Wardle in our Troy office. Today I will be presenting a webinar about liability for animal attacks. The main purpose of this webinar is to provide context relative to landowner, property owner, landlords, and the like in premises liability situations. We typically think of animal liability in terms of the animal's owner. However, a plaintiff may also recover from a landowner even when the landowner is not the owner of the animal. In Michigan, liability for animal attacks can be split into two categories. Common law theories of liability for animal attacks and statutory strict liability for dog bites. There are three common law theories for animal attack liability. Uh, these are strict liability, negligence, and common law liability for landowners. Common law strict liability applies only to the owner or keeper of a domestic animal. Generally, domestic animals include dogs, cats, birds. However, pigs, cows, horses, chickens, and other animals have been considered domestic animals when they have a specific relationship with their human outside of the usual situations that we envision these animals in. Under common law strict liability, the owner or keeper of a domestic animal is liable for damages caused by that animal when the owner or keeper knows or should know of the animal's dangerous or vicious propensities. As you can see, there are several elements to a common law strict liability claim. The easiest to spot is ownership. If you own the animal, you will be strictly liable for bites or attacks of that animal, assuming the knowledge requirement is also met. However, what if you're not the owner of the animal? Then we must determine if you are the keeper of the animal. Notably, a temporary custodian, caretaker, or babysitter is not considered a keeper of the animal for common law strict liability purposes. As the Michigan Supreme Court in Traeger held, a temporary caretaker has no choice regarding whether the dangers an animal presents will be introduced into the community, nor have they agreed to shoulder responsibility for injuries it might inflict. Uh, basically, if you're just temporarily watching someone's domestic animal, you will not be strictly liable for that animal's attacks. However, you may be liable under other common law theories, which we will discuss. The most important element of a common law strict liability claim is whether the owner or keeper knew or should have known of the dangers the animal poses. Uh, we have all heard stories uh, involving pit bulls attacking people. However, in Michigan, dog breed simply does not matter. In fact, our courts have held many times that uh, pit bulls are not categorically dangerous under the law. Additionally, the Court of Appeals has ruled that the breed of the dog was irrelevant to the issue of whether the dog was dangerous and they found that that information was more prejudicial than probative. Uh, therefore, even in cases involving pit bulls, common law strict liability only attaches where the owner or keeper knew or should have known uh, of the dog's dangerous or viciousness. The question you must be asking yourself now is, if the dog's breed is not relevant, then what about the dog's history? Is a history of prior bites conclusive evidence of the dog's viciousness under the common law strict liability framework? Uh, the answer is not so straightforward, but it does provide some guidance. In Veal v. Spencer, the Court of Appeals ruled that evidence of previous bites is relevant in determining whether the owner or keeper knew or should have known of the dog's violent propensities. However, the mere fact that an animal has bitten or attacked someone in the past is not evidence that the animal should be considered vicious as a matter of law. Prior attacks will be taken into account, but it is going to come down to what the owner or keeper knew or should have known about the animal. Similarly, normal dog behavior is not evidence of dangerousness. For example, dogs bark, growl, and jump on people. This is all normal behavior and not admissible to prove that a dog is vicious. Knowledge of an animal's alleged dangers is something that will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. The fact that a dog breed is generally viewed as dangerous, for example, pit bulls, uh, does not matter. 
What matters is did the owner or keeper know that the specific animal was dangerous. As discussed above, common law strict liability applies to domestic animals, which would include equine animals such as horses, mules, or donkeys. However, in most typical equine situations, there is immunity for animal attacks. The Equine Animal Liability Act grants immunity from tort liability in situations where the owner is an equine professional for compensation and the participant sustains an injury as a result of the inherent risk of the activity. Uh, the, court, the Michigan Court of Appeals has ruled that even those visiting, touring, or using an equine facility or stable are considered participants under the EALA. Additionally, professionals must post and maintain uh, conspicuous signs and warnings in the area where the animal is kept. Now we will get into common law negligence for animal attack. Generally, negligence in Michigan is simply stated as duty, breach of duty, causation, and damages. However, in the animal liability context, it must also be proven that the owner, keeper, or temporary caretaker knew or should have known of the animal's dangerous propensities. In common law negligence cases, even a temporary keeper can be negligent for an animal attack. Also, the protections of the EALA will not apply to equine animal attacks when the owner is negligent. Dogs are generally regarded as so unlikely to do substantial harm that their owners or keepers have no duty to keep them under constant control. The mere failure to do so does not constitute an automatic breach of any duty. However, when the animal's dangerous propensities are known or should have been known by the owner, keeper, or temporary care, caretaker, then there is a duty to keep the animal under control. Even so, in situations where there is no knowledge of the animal's dangerousness, the owner, keeper, or temporary caretaker can still be liable for, neg for negligently failing to restrain the animal or to prevent harm. Again, just like in common law strict liability cases, in common law negligence cases, normal animal traits are not conclusive evidence of dangerousness. In an unpublished case, uh, Kenny v. Crane, uh, plaintiffs were jogging past defendant's home when defendant's son let the dog uh, out of the house. The dog ran towards the plaintiff and jumped on its hind legs and placed its front paws on plaintiff's shoulders. The plaintiff fell backwards but was caught by her husband before hitting the ground. The dog then began circling the plaintiffs. The dogs never growled, snarled, barked, nor bit them. Plaintiff alleged an aggravation of a prior back injury uh, and scratches. Eventually, the court in Kenny found that there was no breach of any duty owed to the plaintiffs because no reasonable juror could conclude that defendants were negligent for normal dog behavior that was neither aggressive nor vicious. Plus, the dog had no history of aggressive behavior. Uh, this case reaffirms that normal dog traits are simply not enough to establish that a dog is dangerous or vicious. Now we will discuss how a landowner, property owner, and landlord can be liable for animal attacks. If the landowner is the keeper, owner, or temporary caretaker of an animal, then one or both of these common law strict liability or common law negligence claims could apply. However, the more difficult fact patterns involve those cases where the landowner leases or rents the property to a tenant and that tenant's animal attacks someone. Uh, there are two theories of liability for uh, landowners in those, in those situations, negligence and premises liability. In a negligence case, we must first determine when a duty is imposed on a landowner. Similar to common law negligence for owners and keepers, a duty is only imposed on a landowner for an attack by a tenant's animal when the landowner knows or should know of the animal's dangerousness. However, it is important to note that the mere failure to enforce rules regarding dog breed or size by itself does not create a tort duty on the part of the landlord or landowner. Another issue that comes up relative to landowners, tenants, animals is does the landowner have a duty to protect third parties off of the premises? Uh, generally, the answer is no. Landowners do not owe a duty to protect third parties from attacks by a tenant's animal 
that takes place off the leased premises where the animal was acquired after the premises were leased. However, a landowner may be liable for off-premises attacks when the landowner knows or should know of the dangerous propensities of the animal. Another issue that comes up for landowners is whether a was whether there is a duty to inspect the premises for dangerous animals. After the premises have been leased, there is no separate duty for a landowner to inspect the property to discover the existence of a tenant's dangerous animal. However, when the landowner knows or should know of the animal's dangerous propensities, negligence will attach if the if the landowner does nothing and the animal attacks someone. Another situation where a landowner may be liable for an animal attack is under a theory of premises liability. In a premises liability action, uh, there is liability when there is a condition on the land which causes injuries or damages. Therefore, the issue in a premises liability case becomes, was the animal a condition on the land? Uh, recently, the Michigan Court of Appeals ruled in Trip v. Baker, a dog, uh, was considered a condition on the land. Uh, conditions on the land can be natural or artificial. Uh, the dog was considered to be a condition on the land because it posed uh, artificial risks. However, like all premises liability claims, it had to also be proven that there was actual or constructive uh, knowledge of the dangerousness posed by the animal. As we can see, even in situations where an animal is deemed a condition on the land, it still must be proven that the landowner knew or should have known of the dangers or unreasonable risks that the animal posed. A question that we typically get is what happens when a friend or family member brings uh, an animal more than likely a dog to a party, uh, but the landowner was not watching or keeping the animal during an attack on their property. We typically get these questions and see these situations in cases involving uh, birthday parties, barbecues, or uh, other events held in, at people's homes or in their backyards. In these situations where the landowner does not know of the animal's dangerous propensities, the landowner cannot be liable for their guest's animal attacking someone on their property. Uh, the victim's exclusive remedy would be against the animal's owner. Uh, but again, if you were to allow a dangerous animal on your property and you knew of that animal's dangerousness, uh, as the landowner, you may become liable to the victim. Now we will discuss innkeeper liability. An innkeeper owes a duty to protect its guests from injury and to keep its rooms and the entire building free from vermin. In one unpublished case, a plaintiff was bitten by a spider in a hotel room. While acknowledging that spiders are vermin, the hotel also argued that it complied with its duty by treating plaintiff's room two months before the incident occurred. Uh, the plaintiff countered that the hotel's failed, failure to treat all rooms monthly to ensure effective pest management was a breach of its duty. With these competing arguments, the Court of Appeals found a question of fact uh, remained as to whether the hotel breached its duty to the plaintiff under the innkeeper's liability statute. Uh, the lesson here is even animals you or your business do not harbor could cause potential liability. The other theory of liability in Michigan is statutory liability for dog bites. Statutory strict liability for dog bites applies to dogs only. Uh, notably, comma, dogs are not allowed one free bite and other aggressive behavior by dogs uh, can fall under the dog bite statute that includes uh, scratches or other aggressive behavior that causes injury uh, such as knocking someone over. The dog bite statute imposes almost absolute liability on the dog's owner. Notably, viciousness of the dog or the owner's knowledge of viciousness does not matter. Uh, this is a significant uh, diversion from the common law theories we have previously discussed. Dog bite victims often try to impose statutory liability on property owners when the dog is owned by a tenant. However, Michigan courts have repeatedly rejected this argument. Similarly, a temporary caretaker or 
keeper cannot be considered the dog's owner within the meaning of the dog bite statute. Uh, 24 hour possession, control, and care of a dog will not automatically make a person the dog's owner. Dog ownership must be actual, specific, and not simply perceived. Uh, now we will discuss uh, some defenses to animal attack lawsuits for landowners. In common law actions, both strict liability and strike. I'll start over. Now we will discuss defenses for animal attacks in common law situations involving strict liability, negligence, or premises liability. A landowner does not owe any duty to a trespasser except to refrain from injuring the trespasser by willful or wanted conduct. Basically, you cannot set a trap to induce someone to come onto your property and then get bit or injured by your dog or animal. In, a, in that case, the trespass defense will not work. Additionally, under the dog bite statute, a trespasser is not entitled to any recovery. A dog bite victim must show that they were an invitee or licensee in order to be protected by the dog bite statute. Additionally, comma, a dog bite victim could show that they were appropriately on public property when they were bitten by someone's dog. Nonetheless, uh, even a slight or incidental trespass onto property is enough to trigger uh, the trespass defense in a dog bite case. In an unpublished opinion in 2017, uh, the plaintiff placed his hand on the fence with a portion of his hand extending into the defendant's yard. A defendant's dog then bit him. Uh, this was found to be a trespass, even if it was unintentional. However, if there is an implied license to enter the property, such as in a garage sale context, then the trespass defense uh, may not be act applicable and will likely be a question of fact for the jury. Under the dog bite statute, there is an absolute defense if you can prove that the victim provoked the dog. Typically, provocation comes as an intentional act. However, unintentional acts can satisfy this defense as well. In Brands v. Ekstrom, uh, plaintiff unintentionally stepped on the dog's tail and was bitten in the leg. The court looked at the definition of provocation and found that the intent of the victim was not relevant to determining whether there was provocation in that case. Additionally, uh, some intentional acts are not provocation, where the dogs are already in an aggressive and violent state before the victim makes contact with them. In the Davis case, uh, several escaped dogs entered the plaintiff's property and attacked her cats. In response, she stuck her fingers in one of the dog's eyes and kicked the dog before she was eventually attacked. The court found that plaintiff's intentional acts were not provocation under the statute. Another defense to animal attacks is comparative negligence. However, comparative negligence only applies to common law claims. Under the statute for comparative negligence, a plaintiff's uh, damages will be reduced by their allocation of fault. If they are found to be more than 50% at fault, then non-economic damages will not be awarded. However, plaintiff's economic damages will only be reduced by their percentage of fault in any common law claim, which includes premises liability, negligence, and common law strict liability. In a dog bite statutory claim, comparative fault is not considered. If there is provocation or trespass, then there are absolute defenses to the dog bite statutory claim. But anything short of that is insufficient to relieve the owner of liability under the statute. Just a few practice notes before we uh, wrap up this webinar. Evidence of prior good or bad behavior of a dog is not admissible nor relevant in a statutory dog bite case. Also, a plaintiff can present statutory and common law claims in the same case. Here are a few uh, takeaways in the premises liability context uh, for landowners. If you are a landowner and the dog owner, you will be subject to common law and statutory claims. Landowners can be liable for their tenants' animals, but they must know or should know of the animal's dangerous propensities. Dog breed does not matter regardless of the type of case. A carefully crafted pre-trial motion in limine 
uh, must be filed based on the dog breed uh, given the facts of your case. A landowner's failure to enforce rules about dog breed or size is not a breach of duty. Again, it will come back to what the landowner knew or should have known about the animal. Because a plaintiff can plead multiple theories, it is important to carefully examine plaintiff's complaint and move for summary disposition on any and all claims that can be dismissed. The more claims that can be, the, the more claims that can be presented, the better chance of a large recovery. Therefore, it is always important to narrow the issues as much as possible before trial. Thank you again for listening to this webinar on liability for animal attacks. If you have any questions or want more materials on this subject, please feel free to contact me at your convenience.